that we can start tracking what does it mean to be regenerative and start delivering value more intelligently throughout our economy using some of the research that's already been done and built upon that, which is what we've already done in seeds. Hello, my name is still Raiky Corden, and if you've just watched the first two episodes of this series, you're beginning to realize that we have all the pieces we need for a minimum viable regenerative civilization. So the basic foundation we need to opt into a new type of economic system and start growing the new civilizations we want to see. So this episode is going to focus on how do you participate? So you're like, wow, this is a whole lot going on, which is our biggest you know, critique as people join the ecosystem. They're saying, wow, there's a whole lot going on. How do I get involved? How do I practically participate in this change? So we're gonna explore a bunch of avenues throughout the rest of this video. First, we're gonna give a little bit more context on what is a regenerative civilization. Now there's a lot of different maps and the reality is, is we don't know. You know, part of regeneration is constant growth and learning. So no map is a perfect map. So that's why there's a lot of different maps throughout the seeds ecosystem on what it means to be regenerative because there's not necessarily you know, an agreed upon definition. And if you also check out the SEEDS constitution, you could see our take, the SEEDS ecosystem's take, on what is a regenerative economy. What are the basic principles that could give rise to regenerative economies? But just real quick, I'm gonna to touch on some basic principles here. First and foremost is in right relationship. So this is remembering, you know, that everything else on this planet is alive too, not just humans. And what does the, what does it mean to respect the sovereignty of the rest of these species? What does it mean to give a river voice like they did in New Zealand? What does it mean to give voice to nature so that we are no longer owners and subjugators of nature of the rest of the world, just like we can no longer be owners and subjugators of other humans because we realize that wasn't an ethical way of living. I think the next stage is moving that same principle onto the rest of life. So what does it mean to be in right relationship with the rest of life? That's one of the first principles we've been exploring and we'll get into regen civics a little bit later in this video about how we're practically experimenting with that idea on the ground. Next is views wealth holistically. We're gonna to touch on the eight forms of capital and what does it mean to you know, see the world in much more terms than dollar value or how valuable something is in terms of financial value or only seeing financial contributions as a form of wealth. So seeing a wider lens on what is a form of a contribution. Innovative, adaptive, responsive. This is why we got so deep into governance and how we can continually evolving these tools to best meet our needs. But also, how do we push governance out to the edges? So then now we're trying to create new centralized monoliths, but we're looking at governance on the lowest form possible. So the smallest number of people who are impacted can have the most voice in those decisions. And that's gonna increase responsiveness. But this is also going to empower participation. That's what all of this is about, is giving us tools to directly get involved in the change we want to see. So it's no longer us waiting around for nation states and corporations to save us from climate change, but it's giving us the tools we need to coordinate at scale to opt into entirely new economic systems that we are in direct governance of. So this is the highest form of empowered participation by going to the lowest organizing principles, our economies, and rethinking them from the ground up. This is also why, if we move on to three with honor, place, and community, where creating that diversity of on the ground projects and pushing governance out to the edges will do that by design and by default, because communities will use the governance process based on their own cultures and what they believe to be right, what they believe to be regenerative, what they believe to be the organizing principles that they best enjoy, etc., And they're gonna design unique instances of localized economic and governance systems that equate to their culture and values. 
So this is really important. And this is also how we get the diversity of projects that we need in order to really create resilient ecosystems. Because this is how evolution works. To providing a basic DNA blueprint where things continually branch off and fork and create new experiments and new diversity and new life. Um, so that's exactly how all of this technology is built to be forkable. It's all open source so that anyone can come in and be like, wow, I really love this seeds economy, but I would tweak this, this, and this. And I want to launch my own instance of a completely different economic system. And if a million people agree with them, and then they've just created an alternative economic system and they can start having entirely unique ways of how they distribute value. What do they consider a contribution score, etc. So it's really important to provide that foundation for diversity to flourish. Because this is where that edge effect really takes place. Because once that diversity is growing, we're going to learn from each other. So as communities are experimenting in a wide diversity of ways, then we can evolve together. So this is what the you know, edge effect is really about. Because that's where the most diversity comes and co-mingles is at the edges, where we have the highest capacity to learn new things and learn from each other. Robust circulation. This is why we wanted seeds to be a better than free currency. So rather than the, you know, prime strategy for this crypto token is to buy it, you know, put it into a cold storage wallet somewhere and then lock it into the ground and forget about it for 10 years. Instead, we say, actually, this is a currency. We want you to circulate it. So that's why seeds is better than free is for that robust circulation for a healthy ecosystem to form. And then seeks balance. So that's the other principle of the seeds currency is that we want to be neither inflationary nor deflationary. We want a stable economy. Today's capitalistic markets, they want volatility because that's how day traders, who are actually the ones kind of ironically deciding where humanity evolves towards, because they're the ones that are funding the companies, which are driving the strategic decisions of our biggest coordinating monoliths. You know, all these multinationals, they're making decisions based off the market. The market is driven by day trading, which wants volatility because when prices are moving up and down really rapidly, then you're able to sell high and buy low. That's the basis of day trading, right? So the more volatile it is, the more opportunity for selling high and buying low, right? So we want the antithesis of that. So that's why we're seeking an economic system that is stable. So it's neither inflationary nor deflationary. So all of these principles come together to create what we call a regenerative economic system. So as you can see here, there's a lot of different maps and we're going to continually create and update these maps as we learn more. So this is really a learning journey. We're not saying we know exactly where we're going. We say we understand that there's some coordinating principles that if we follow these principles, then we can create new types of systems. So it's an emergent process. So a lot of us, we feel like we're more like anthropologists studying something rather than you know, architects designing something. So it's a very interesting relationship when we come together as a whole global community, what that looks like when we let some structures emerge through us and around us, which is what we've actually been doing the last 10 years is holding that space for that emergence to happen and then mapping the structures that formed. So a lot of what you're gonna see throughout the rest of the video was a result of that process of letting structures emerge, then mapping those structures and being like, wow, this is a different type of system that we wouldn't have thought of if we just went to paper first and tried to you know, architect it out that way. Okay, so where are we at today? So there's just a real quick snapshot, 100 different countries, 50 different languages. Um, we have 10,550 people who have been invited into the Seeds ecosystem. So instead of a network that just pays people to join because we want numbers to go up, we said actually every person here needs to be invited. Because we weren't just trying to grow. We were trying to bring together a collective intelligence container. So a lot of people who saw the same need to transition into regenerative economies. We wanted those people to show up and be part of this collective intelligence process to help form the DNA and foundations. So we wanted people to be there because they really wanted to be there. We didn't want people to be there just because, you know, token price might go up or something like that. Um, so that's why we kind of turned that around and said, nope, everyone has to be invited. And that means you have to send some seeds to invite somebody else. And then in order to participate, you have to contribute more time and value in order to 
um, become a governing citizen. So we have 477 of those people who have gone through a process of contributing value and time and energy and going through a process of understanding how a lot of this works so that they can start governing the system. So these are the people who are help guiding and evolving seeds. Um, then we have about 450 organizations that have either set up a seeds organization account or applied to be part of the Alliance. And then we have seven commons organizations. So these are groups of people who have come together and formed a new organization around one of the many ways that the seeds ecosystem um, needs to grow and evolve. So if you come here, you can see our dashboard. If you open up the show notes, you see a link to the slide deck that I'm presenting here where you can go there and then click on all the links and explore everything and all the pictures that you see here. Um, but this dashboard is a quick snapshot of all the things happening in the ecosystem from three main lenses, people, planet, and shared prosperity. And then we also have some of the main organizing principles within the Seeds ecosystem front and center. So you see where we're at in the economic and governance cycle, which is every new moon to new moon. So that's 16 days left before a new cycle starts. Four days when this was recorded until the next regenerative roundtable, uh, next milestone, etc. And then you see the go live readiness. So this is when is seeds ready to evolve to a more stable economy. So this is actually tracking the health and indicators of a successful economic system. So as you see, we're actually not quite there yet. So we're getting there. Um, on the right, you see prosperity. So this is more the economic metrics. So how many seeds have been distributed for where? How many seeds are in circulation? So you see we have 138 million. You see the total market cap, which is really just the price, which this is tracking at 10 cents, which is how many is the price that the seeds commons is selling them for. And we'll get into that in a little bit later. But basically it's in circulation times price is the market cap of the seeds economy. So it's saying the market cap right now is about 13 million. And then there's 20 million seeds planted. So this is seeds that have been locked out of circulation. And then 36 million seeds have been sold from the commons. So this is tracking all the seeds that are being sold to people who are contributing to the ecosystem and economy. And then over on the left, you see people. So basic growth conditions. And then under that, you see governance. So we see that there's been 101 invite campaigns run. We see that we have 15 alliance proposals have been passed. So these are different groups and organizations that had successfully passed a proposal from the citizens to get an alliance share of seeds, which we'll also talk about a bit later. Um, and then seven commons organizations have been successfully voted in by the seed citizens. So this is a quick snapshot of our governance over the years. And if you're looking here, you actually see, if you run through the wallet, all the different proposals that have come up. So we've learned a lot through the last couple of years of doing decentralized governance. And that's also informed the new structure that I've been sharing with you in the last couple of videos and throughout the rest of this one. Um, down up here, you see there's been 450 businesses that have been set up, eight public organizations and zero regions because the region tooling isn't ready yet, but that's something that we're moving into next. So hopefully we start seeing the regions start growing once they are able to actually get set up. And then on the bottom, this is where we track the contributions to planet. So when we're funding campaigns and alliances, we're actually putting them into a pool of where those seeds went based on whatever the focus of those campaigns or alliance was. So you can see the majority have gone to education so far um, because that's been a huge thing in the seeds ecosystem is it's the chief complaint is people show up. It's like, hey, it's too complex. We need more support and understanding what's happening and going on here. So you can see that's been the main thing that's been funded up until now. But then you come over here and you see, you know, 5.8 million to local food, 4.6 million to land care, reforestation, social equality, etc. So this is a version 1.0 of being able to just track what's going on in our economic system. Um, we'll keep going on from there. You can get a quick brief overview of all the traction. So we've been in several books so far and different reports. You can come here and check all of them out and see links to them. Um, a bunch of different podcasts and overview episodes and all this. So if you watch this, you can get an understanding of who's including seeds in their case studies. Because that's also something we've been focusing on is how practical is this economic system? It's really, we're going through the process of iterating, testing, and designing an alternative to capitalism. So that's why we spend a lot of time with organizations like R3.0. 
and understanding their research over the years. Because there's been a lot of brilliant organizations who have focused on what does it mean to build a regenerative economy. But a lot of that has been theoretical. Because, you know, usually it's they design a new model for a regenerative economic system, then the next step is to take that to nation states and use policy to try to shift, you know, these degenerative economic systems towards more regenerative practices. But unfortunately, they don't get into, <laughs> they don't get put into practice. We don't get to test them, we don't get to evolve them, we don't get to experiment with them because nation states are reluctant to change. So it's really powerful with this whole Web 3.0, crypto, be able to create, you know, economic systems, you know, technology here, is that we get to experiment with all of this research. Then we can start practically applying the theory of how do you build a regenerative economy. And we can start codifying successful patterns. So this is what we talked about with contribution protocols and contribution scores, all of that. And episode one, go back to that if you want to dive into that deeper. But the idea is, is that we can start tracking what does it mean to be regenerative and start delivering value more intelligently throughout our economy using some of the research that's already been done and built upon that, which is what we've already done in Seeds. I mean, it's a cliche to say, but we've only gotten this far because we're standing on the shoulders of giants and we're using a mountain of wisdom and understanding from all sorts of different groups, you know, to be able to get to where we're at. Um, let's keep going. All right, so what we're building here is a minimum viable regenerative civilization. So it's the basic blueprint that we can then go out and experiment with creating the alternatives to nation states that we need to create today, the alternatives to capitalism. It's nothing that's been designed in the 20th century. We've tested those things out. We need to design completely new economic systems, completely new governance systems, and we need to experiment with them. We need to just practically apply basic business logic to, let's say we're building a new civilization, cool, how do we get there? How do we reverse engineer the steps and then take those steps? Rather than just saying it's too monumental a task to even you know, take on, let's just continue to try to use policy to sway nation state opinions, even though for the last many, many decades, that's clearly not worked. It's not helped. It's made virtually no impact. All the policy and all the research, and we keep bringing that to nation states and it's landing on deaf ears. Because as we talked about a little bit in episode one, it's functionally not possible. It's like trying to run the latest MMORPG online game on the first Macintosh. Our current economic and governance systems, they weren't designed for the crises that humanity is experiencing today. So we just need to start over from first principles and redesign civilization stacks that are intentionally designed to solve these crises and solve these systemic problems. So we're not saying necessarily seeds is it, which is why we say this is one pathway. We're saying this is a pathway that we're open sourcing, that we're sharing with the world, that we encourage people to actually look at it. And if it's broken, you know, significantly, then fork it, build a completely new, a new economic system that has uh, the things fixed that you think weren't gonna work. If they're small changes, or even if they're huge changes anyway, we have a decentralized governance process designed for that purpose. So as people come in and we poke it and we say, nope, there's a flaw, we need to fix this. Great, that is the process of collective intelligence. People coming in, bringing their wisdom, saying we need to improve it here, going about the process of improving it, and then evolving and healing and growing our ecosystem. So as long as we all collectively agree that we need to do this, and we go through the process of coming together and slowly testing, iterating, evolving it, then it's going to happen. It's just a matter of time at that point and whether or not everyone decides to give up. But as long as we don't give up and we keep evolving and iterating, then we're going to keep getting better and then we'll have a new economic system that is evolvable. But we needed to start with that minimum viable regeneration <laughs> civilization tech stack, right? And that's what we've built and that's where we're at today. And now I want to walk through, great, now how do we run through actually using these tools to opt into a new economic system? So we're on a journey to regenerative civilizations, but how do we know how to get there? So this is our big coordination challenge. It's how do we coordinate across a whole bunch of different people in order to transition from one civilization to the next when we don't actually know how to get there. So we can't build a roadmap. We don't know what the destination even looks like, let alone for us to say, this is exactly how we get there. So building maps is exceedingly difficult in this movement because we don't necessarily know where we're going or how we're gonna get there. 
All we understand are the different patterns that help this emergence come about. Meaning, what patterns of collaboration can we employ and that if we just keep employing that pattern over and over, beautiful things are going to happen. <laughs> um, so this is what we attempted to do in the Constitution. It is our compass. It's something for us to reference as we're navigating this new space, as we're exploring new territories. We can use it to help guide us through this process. And the compass and the Constitution, it's meant to be evolved. So as we look at that Constitution and we see those patterns and we say, hey, this pattern's actually not serving us the best way. We think it would be more regenerative or to help build more thriving cultures if we had this pattern. And then we could put up a proposal and we can evolve the Constitution. So even the Constitution is meant to continually update itself. So I highly recommend the Constitution to get the full answer of, you know, what are our guiding principles. But there's a couple that I wanted to talk about today because we need a North Star and a compass to align to if we are governed by the people. Because if we have a bunch of different compasses and a bunch of different things we're trying to accomplish, then decentralized governance is gonna get really messy and it's not gonna work. So we need some first principles to align around. And I show The Dawn of Everything, A New History of Humanity. It's a book that I just recently finished and absolutely adore and love, highly recommend this. Because they go back and they look at that, you know, innate period, you know, the, at least the civilization that I was born into, our education system, it talks about the biggest oligarchs of history, the mafias, the war, like who was in charge, who built the best empire, etc. It's always talking about who was the biggest, you know, warlord and what were their achievements, how big of a monument were they able to build to themselves. But then there's huge swaths of human time, hundreds of years that we say, ah, oh, nothing interesting happened during that time, and we don't even talk about it. But what they've pondered is maybe it's the exact opposite. Maybe it's those periods of stability where humans are actually living in relative harmony with each other and the world around them that are the most interesting. What principles and patterns and social systems were they living in that afforded them that freedom, that afforded them to not be destroying the world so that we can actually see signs of their existence, right? I mean, that's where we look through history, where we see you know, examples of humans, we see the ones that are the most destructive, not the ones that were living in most harmony with their environment because they don't leave a trace. And the first one's freedom. And this is something that a lot of our cultures talk about. Uh, the dominant cultures, they, they tend to say this is the highest ideal of why that culture exists, is to support freedom. But what does freedom even mean? It's a very difficult word to actually define. And what I have up here is The Dawn of Everything, A New History of Humanity. It's a book by David Graeber and David Wengrow, so two anthropologists, is they said there's three primordial freedoms, that if you don't have these freedoms, then you don't actually have freedom. So they defined the first one as the freedom to move across Earth. So if you're ability to move across this earth that we all equally share is restricted, then you don't have full freedom. The second primordial freedom, they said, was the freedom to disobey, which is one of the primary characteristics of a slave, right? They don't have the freedom to do their own actions, to not listen to orders, otherwise something really bad is going to happen. So this one's pretty obvious. If you're not able to say no to a command, then you're not free. You're enslaved to whoever's able to give you those commands, right? And the final one is, and this one's a really deep one, and it's the one that we're focused within Seeds on amplifying, and it's the freedom to negotiate unique social relationships. So at the base form, this is the freedom to come together with other humans and say, hey, how do we want to collaborate to best meet our, each other's needs and our own needs? If we're coming together as a group of people to do something, how do we best do that? What agreements can we make? And that's what Seeds is all about. And this whole movement's about is giving us a whole bunch of new tools to come together and set new type of relationships up. Because if you really look at back across these three different freedoms, you know, do our current dominant economic and global and geopolitical and organization and corporate systems, do they amplify these freedoms or do they restrict them? And something for us to deeply consider is if we believe freedom is something that we really need to be building systems for, I think it's time for us to take an honest look at our current organization, governance, economic, and financial systems and say, are these systems providing us more or less freedom? 
So if we can make it as simple as changing apps, you know, from going from one token and one app to another one and just learning a little bit about a different culture, if we can make it so that you can change economic systems in a weekend, then we're amplifying that freedom to disobey. Because if one system that you're participating in, it starts restricting your freedoms or harming you in any way where you don't want to be part of that system anymore, then you have the freedom to move which is what the third freedom is all about, the freedom to negotiate unique social relationships. So that we have the freedom to say, look, that economic and governance system is not serving me. So if I can make a new one and then a hundred people, you know, or even a thousand people, whoever feels like they want to join this new system as well, then we can opt out. And we have the freedom to create new types of economic realities. And it is the economic system that's sitting at the foundation that's driving so much of our life and behavior. Our lives are innately like to the core impacted by our economic systems and how they're set up. So we need to have the freedom to negotiate new types of economic systems with the people that we wanna coordinate with. And that's all that we're doing here is building open source tools to help drive more ability to experiment with new types of economic systems that one would provide us more freedom. And the second one is all about regeneration. So we talk about this because again, none of these experiments really matter all that much if we kill our planet. We could build the most free economic system that gives prosperity to all, but if we kill our ecosphere, then none of that matters. So our economic systems need to be regenerative by design, which is why you see that all throughout seeds where we're trying to coordinate systemic regeneration. This is how evolution happens is through that freedom to negotiate something unique, which is creating a new species. So we can actually see an economic system that looks like this, that's creating more diversity as it's evolving through time and space. So that we have more diverse economic systems, rather than what's happened the last few millennia where we've been concentrating it into one monolith. We're now basically across the globe, we see the same type of economic system in 90 plus percent of the world, similar type of political systems, like we've been over time reducing diversity. And anyone who understands complex ecosystems, that creates a more fragile environment rather than less. So as far as civilization and humanity is concerned, we're creating a more fragile environment because we've been concentrating into one type of system. And if that system fails, everything fails. What we need to do is the exact opposite. We need a diversity of new economic systems a plethora of them. And if one of them fails, then it might not even be noticed. It's like one species going extinct in the Amazon. It's an incredible loss, but most people wouldn't notice that. And that's how we need to make our economic systems, that if one disappears, it's not a global collapse. And unfortunately, that's the situation we've built today. So this is why we do everything open source. We're trying to share our learnings. We're trying to make the tools easy to copy, fork, adapt, and try new experiments with because we know that this is the process of regeneration is through creating more diversity. And that's also how we get more freedom because there's more choices for people to move to systems that best represent their ideals. So this is baked into the, the heart of what Seeds is, is that in each progressive layer, there's a smaller container of people that are making unique choices that are creating unique economic and cultural and governance systems. So every community, every organization, um, and we'll get into it all later, gets to experiment with new ways of coming together and making decisions and coordinating. And then over time, we would see that we have more diversity and more resiliency in our global civilization systems. So here's some of the pilots that we have going on right now. It's important for us to have a wide diversity of pilots because then we understand some of those coordinating principles because we discover organizing principles as we put our patterns out there and we keep trialing experiments, we see similarities across. And those are the things that we wanna to try to codify into our constitution and into our guide is when we find healthy patterns then we can codify those patterns so that other groups can learn more easily and so that we can adapt and evolve and continue improving. Um, so that's kind of how evolution happens in this system is we go out there, we try and experiment on the ground and then we say, ooh, actually that economic setting, like maybe we had too much inflation in this environment and that you know economy collapsed in that local community. And we're like, oh, okay, so now we know if inflation goes too high, it goes past this setting, then we have systemic problems. Cool, so we can learn that. And then other communities can then employ that same methodology, right? 
That's just one example, but there's, you know, infinite examples of the things that we can learn when we're getting on the ground and getting really practical with putting these tools to use. And that's kind of the shift you see happening in the seeds ecosystem right now is for, you know, the last decade, as you saw in episode one, we've been learning, we've been experimenting, we've been trying different things. And in the last five or six years, we've been really heavily focused on building tools because there was so much that actually needed to be built in order to provide that minimum viable civilization foundation that we've been talking about. But now it's here, and now we gotta take those tools and start applying them in the field, on the ground, doing regenerative work, and seeing how these tools can support us. And that will be what the second half of this video is about, is getting into regen civics and how we're doing that today. All right, so there's a recap of where we're at. Now I'm gonna dive right into how to contribute. So how do you participate in this movement? So what you see over here, again, I'm gonna keep showing this because this is a representation of all the different organs within the seeds ecosystem. So if we're building this new type of you know, metahuman, this new coordination, whatever we're calling it, but this new type of economic system, then it's comprised of a whole bunch of different organizations. And this is where you contribute, is to one of those organizations. Um, and we're gonna get into that. But first and foremost, the easiest way to contribute is through buying seeds. So this is actually how you fund and give working capital, is what we're calling it, to the Seeds Commons. So when anyone goes to buyseeds.earth today and they buy some seeds, then you're actually buying them from the Seeds Commons. So then you're trading your Bitcoin or you know, central bank currency equivalent to seeds. And then what this is doing is it's giving a working capital pool to the Seeds Commons, which this is money that people who are contributing they, they need to turn it back into dollars or euros or yen or whatever because they need it to pay rent today. And currently their local economies, they're not accepting seeds. So we need to transition. And in order to transition and to help people and to support people equitably, we need to make sure that they can put a roof over their heads and pay food and still participate in the old economic system as we transition. So this is how we fund the transition, is if you buy seeds from the Seeds Commons, then you get global seeds. Um, we're calling these G-seeds, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, but this is basically the currency of the new economic system, right? And how you get that, and the easiest way to get that, and the most effective way to support this movement is to come to buyseeds.earth and then buy those from the commons. So the very basic principle behind all of this is instead of it being more profitable to exploit our natural world, we want to reward the regeneration of our planet. So we wanted to align what's most profitable and rewarding and incentive driven, et cetera, with what's gonna heal our planet in the most effective way. And buying seeds is also one way of doing that because if seeds as an economy succeeds, then those currency units that you're buying from the seeds economy become more valuable, more valuable than the dollar equivalents, et cetera, that you sold them for. So this is really, it's no different in concept of trading your euros out for yen or your dollars out for euros, etc. when you come to a new economic system. So if you're visiting from one country to the next, you typically trade out your currency units for their currency units. It's the same things in the seeds economy. And then the value of those currency units, just like today in nation, national economies, is predicated on how healthy and successful that economic system is. So that's the whole principle here, is if you're buying into seeds, you're opting into a new type of economic system. One that is a whole lot different and is modeling alternatives to our current nation state and central bank budgeting systems. So instead of trillions of dollars going towards all of these problems and concentrating wealth, right, we can create alternative economic systems that are funding the solutions. So then buying seeds is one way of saying, yep, I believe something like this is the future and I wanna be a part of it, I feel, you know, the old financial systems, they're decaying and they're not going to make it. So if you feel that way, then this is a way of opting out of those systems and into new systems. While at the same time, then supporting the commons so that they can fund all these different groups so that people can full time join this ecosystem. Because that's been the limiting factor up until now. We've just started this commons model. and We're just now running through the season. So we're testing out this structure to see how it works. But up until now, it's been mostly like volunteer led effort is people weren't able to get any type of compensation, at least the most people who have been contributing to seeds uh, to be able to pay rent and pay for food, etc. So they had a really difficult time balancing how they were going to survive in the old systems and participating in the new. 
So this can create that positive feedback loop where we can start funding effectively all the different organizations within our ecosystem so we can start actually moving forward with some momentum. Um, so that's one of the downsides of you know not focusing on capital raising up until now is we've been a very low funded ecosystem so far. Um, like you said, you could go to the dashboard and you could see the total number of seeds sold so far and it's not that many. So it's been a very small amount of capital that's been crowdfunded into this ecosystem so far for us to make all the progress we've made. I'm talking just a few million. So when you're seeing like massive raises for other projects that have been able to get hundreds of millions, you know, how could we deploy hundreds of millions more effectively in an economic system like this? So these are the questions we're exploring so that we can go and seek more funding and actually put that funding to effective use. Because funding could also be a serious problem. If we didn't have this container up first and a lot of funding went into one space, incentives change. People get greedy, they, they're not willing to take risks, etc. And it kind of slows down innovation once you get too heavily funded. So it has this, this <laughs> it has a dark side if we don't do it effectively. So we needed to make sure that we built structures to distribute those resources out to the ecosystem before we got heavily funded. Um, and this is where we're at right now, is exploring version 1.0 of what does that ecosystemic funding and resource model actually look like. Okay, so we're gonna keep going. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the seeds currencies. So first, once upon a time, if you see down here, it started off as just seeds. We had this concept of a seeds currency model. We touched on this more in episode one, but we have this concept of a seeds currency that was gonna first be a fixed supply, high volatile one, and then over time it would eventually, you know, taper off and become stable. Um, and about a year ago, uh, citizens voted down a significant proposal to fund Haifa again. And this is actually what kickstarted the whole process of coming up with one, the seeds commons model, and two, the multiple currency model. Is because the citizens voiced their opinion and they decided that the current economic and governance model was broken. One of the reasons was, is there was only one organization who was really benefiting from the seed sale. So when you went to joinseeds.earth and you bought seeds, then you're just buying them from Haifa. And that was the reality for the first uh, few years of seeds existence. And that's because when we originally set up Haifa, we thought this would be the organization that all the humans who are contributing to the ecosystem can join. But very quickly we broke down because we realized that's way too much complexity and people who are building tools do they really need to weigh in on the opinions of people who are doing marketing and storytelling everyone thought no <laughs> so we actually realized that just like in our bodies and how they have multiple organs we needed multiple organs we couldn't just be a body with just a heart which is what the ecosystem kind of was at the beginning and since we were you know employing our <laughs> our regenerative principles of organizing rather than us saying nope let's keep focusing it all in Haifa like Haifa's got to own all the IP etc we opened it up and we encouraged other organizations to get started and set up in the seeds ecosystem which is what gave rise to this model you see here with a bunch of different organizations so it's no longer just Haifa there's also do tell there's a strategy do forming right now regen civics do permaculture Permitors do, the Ambassador Academy do, Samara do, Mom do, Renaissance Explorers do, Renaissance U do, you know, etc. So we have a lot of different organizations all forming to form those different functions in the ecosystem. So when that was happening, then they're saying, well, it doesn't make sense anymore that when you buy seeds from the sales site, that they just all go to Haifa. And we're like, you're absolutely right. <laughs> so that's where the seeds commons set up and we transferred all the authority over to the seeds commons. So now when seeds are sold from the site, they're going to that commons pool, which is then delivered out to all the organizations. Next, our people on the ground were saying, we want a stable currency now. We're wanting to exchange with it. We're not really interested in, you know, a volatile currency that might go up in price. Like that's not what we're here for. We just want a constant currency today. Simultaneously, communities within seeds are saying, well, we want to create our own types of currencies. We want to have these things we call a prosperity pool, which we're backing it by a whole bunch of local value, like local company value or land or whatever. So they're saying, well, we can build local circular economies more effectively if we had our own currency. So it started this long dialogue process of how do we weave these diverse or seemingly diverse perspectives into one. And after about, I think, eight months of weekly conversation and 
definitely go check out the calls if you're into this type of stuff. Um, a new model emerged, which is the Seeds family of currencies. So you can actually come here, click on this link if you actually want to explore this model a little bit more in depth. Um, but it lays it out pretty simply. The global seeds are the global ones. These ones kind of connect the whole global ecosystem. And they're the seeds that you buy when you're buying seeds from the commons. Constant seeds, they're constant to some local currency or some central bank currency. So when people are used to, you know, exchanging in euros, dollar, yen, whatever it is, and they don't want to switch to an entirely new monetary system and way of pricing things, etc., then they can use constant seeds, which are basically just seeds minus official inflation. And then we have community seeds, which community seeds could be a wide diversity of ways that communities set up their own currencies. And Haifa actually made a tool for communities to be able to issue their own community currency, should they choose to. So we made it really easy to be able to then control and mint and exchange with new types of currencies. And you see here in the wallet as well, where you can be able to swipe through and use any one of these currencies um, as we get going forward. All right, so highly recommend checking out the Seeds Currency family more if you're really interested in currencies and want to know what you're buying when you buy seeds from the commons. So one thing that's really important to talk about is if people are pricing success in dollars or other central bank currencies, and if your goal is to grow your dollars or other central bank currencies, meaning you want to come into this ecosystem, see your dollars go up and then exit the ecosystem, then we'll fail. If more people, if that's their goal, then this thing will fail because there's no possible for more dollars to come out than went in, right? And any ecosystem that promises this, it's a scam, and this is the basis of all Ponzi schemes, etc. So in order for seeds to not be a Ponzi scheme, it can't have the end state being we want everyone to go back out into central bank money. The only way this works is if it's actually a transition into a new economic system. Right? And this is why a lot of our protocols are about creating healthier economies. So having a better than free currency. So we have a lot of exchange. So it's actually better to exchange with seeds than it is these central bank currencies. Having a more stable currency, so it's better to price your goods and services in seeds and constant seeds, etc., than it is to price it in dollars. Which, if you're taking a salary in dollars or other central bank currencies, if you're not getting a raise equal to inflation every year, then you're actually getting a demotion. So on a lot of people, you get that 5% raise every year, you're not getting a raise, you're just getting inflation offset. So that's why it's so critical to have a stable currency and unit of account. And that's the other need seeds is trying to fill. So if our end state is we enter a new financial system where we're exchanging with this new currency and we no longer need central bank money, then we succeed. So it's really important, like seeds grows when capitalism and the other economic systems and central bank currencies, etc., shrink. So that's where the value is coming from. Value always is coming from something. Energy is coming from one place to another. So in this particular scenario, where is seeds getting its energy and momentum from? Is from the energy leaving the failing currency and economic systems today. Ooh, so that's a really, really big concept. Um, but again, it's really, really important to ground into the idea that if your goal is to grow your, you know, central bank dollar, currency, euro, etc., value then this definitely isn't for you. If your goal is to opt into a new financial system and use a new currency to start exchanging with, getting other people to start exchanging with it and opting into a new financial and economic system, then that's what we're doing here. And that's how we win. So um, just reiterating, Seed is 100% grassroots funded and passionately built. Uh, up until now, it's been a lot of, you know, how do you coordinate essentially volunteer effort? Because the vast majority of people who've been contributing to seeds haven't got some pay up front that they can immediately convert to pay for rent and buy food. Seeds itself haven't been that liquid. So we've had, it's been very difficult to mo maintain momentum without being able to give people that security. So that's also what we're hoping to shift here is to actually shift gears and say, okay, now we've built a structure that we can get behind that we feel the DNA and the patterns that are coordinating the evolution of the system make sense. They're no longer concentrating wealth that wasn't forcing too much power to one organization, which historically was Haifa. And we have a multiple currency model that starts meeting the various needs of the ecosystem today. 
So we wanted to make sure we had that healthy foundation before we ever approached our community again and saying, hey, like now is a good time to come in and start supporting this change if you wanna get behind it, if you really want to see this happen. Um, so that's kind of the process of the last couple of videos too, is we're saying, all right, we are ready to bring in more capital to give working capital to all those epic humans who've been part of Seed so far, who want to make this their full-time job, who if they do, we have the capacity within the ecosystem where if we can coordinate it well, we can start seeing very significant progress towards transitioning to regenerative economies. We can start funding people to be able to go to communities on the ground and teach them how to use these tools, teach them how to create circular economies, and help people transition. We need to fund that. There's that fighter jet again, another reminder of why we need to build new financial and economic systems. Um, so where is the Global Commons getting those seeds that they're selling on buyseeds.earth? Well, currently they took over the milestone seeds. So there's about 78 million seeds that were set aside initially to fund the development towards Go Live. So the Commons is taking those 77 million over and that's what they have in order to sell to anyone who's buying them from buyseeds.earth. And then after Go Live, the Seeds Commons is getting funded through the economic system. So when we're creating new seeds because there's new demand for them, then N% percent is gonna go to the Global Commons, which they can continue to sell from buyseeds.earth um, to fund each season as we go forward. So this is how we can perpetually run this financial system whilst maintaining stability, right? The other way you can contribute financially is by buying tokens directly from any one of those organizations. So here you can actually see HIFAs where you can buy a token directly from HIFA. Then you're buying that organization's token. And that token, it could represent anything. It could just represent a receipt of a donation to a 501c3. Or it can represent a share of a legal company in a Wyoming DAO LLC. And you can actually attach your DAO container here uh, and set up a legal entity. So where buying tokens is buying shares or you can design anything in between. So it's up to each community to design what their token means. But the foundation for it is to give people a way to contribute in a myriad of different ways. Uh, we're gonna get into all the other ones later, but if you wanna contribute financially, the easiest way is to just go and buy that organization's token. Um, highly recommend you understand that organization and what their token means beforehand. And we'll give you an example of tokenomics, which is token design, um, a little bit later with HIFAs. Um, so what you see here is when you show up to Seeds and you want to know how to contribute, we follow this concept of Ikigai. It's a Japanese concept, but we kind of re-engineered it for regenerative. Um, so we call it the regenerative Ikigai. So at the very top of it is like, what do you love creating? Because self-organization, for it to work, self-organization means people are coming together and they know what they need to do when they're doing it. We don't need a top-down hierarchy commanding people what to do for things to get done. And in order for this to really work, we need to embody this Ikigai principle. Because if people are doing what they love creating, then they don't need any boss making sure that they're being held accountable and if they're checking in the enough hours or you know, checking up on them, etc. Because people are doing what they love. So that's core and foundation to this, is we need to find something that you're gonna love doing. And then next in this diagram is what the Renaissance needs. Okay, so you need to love doing it, but it also needs to be something that humanity needs, that this transition needs. So we're calling the Renaissance, the transition from degenerative economies to regenerative economies. So what does that transition need, right? And then at the bottom of this is what will seeds pay you for? And seeds will pay you for practically anything the Renaissance needs. <laughs> and if it doesn't currently exist, then that's an opportunity for you to create a new role in the ecosystem. So that's how it continues to evolve too. Because if you sense something that you love creating and that the Renaissance needs and it, it doesn't exist yet, then you can propose that it does exist. You could say, hey, I think this role would be really valuable for the movement. I'm going to propose that it exists. And then the community can decide if they want that to exist or not. And that's how a DAO evolves, a do is what we call them. And check how to do a do here and you can actually check out that whole entire process. Um, so at the bottom is what will seeds pay for, and then over at the left, it's what you're good at. And it doesn't matter if you're necessarily good at it now, because you can get better at it. So a lot of us need to reskill. There does need to be a re-education process. Learning what worked in degenerative economies might not necessarily work anymore here. So maybe some of the skills you've built in old systems aren't applicable here anymore. So, you know, what you're good at might need to grow over time. But this is what we're trying to embody 
is how do we help people find what they love creating, what the Renaissance needs, what we can pay them for, and what they're good at. And if we can find this, then we've created the foundations for self-organization to really work. Because then in that case, you don't need top-down bosses making sure that things are happening. People are doing what they love and they're sensing what's needed. And we're self-organizing. So, we talked about other forms of capital. Oh, there's that fighter jet again in one second. Ooh. All of this because we're living in a financial system that's not giving voice to people. Because I bet if people had a choice in where money was going, they wouldn't fund the military industrial complex so much. Probably a lot more funding would go to education and house care and basic needs, you know, paying off student loan debts rather than funding a failed fighter jet program. Anyhow, um, <laughs> So if you're unfamiliar with this map, this is showing the eight forms of capital. So it's one way of looking at the different types of capital that people can bring to a project. So you see that financial capital, you know, money, financial instruments, that's one type of capital. That's one way to contribute to all of these projects. But these projects need way more than just money, right? If it's a regenerative on the ground project, it needs land, it needs living capital, right? If it's a research project or really any of these projects, they need intellectual capital. They need people to be there working with ideas, moving things forward. They need social capital. We need experiential capital, etc. All of these different forms can be contributed to a project. And then tokens can reflect value back out for all of these different contributions. We'll talk really practically about what this looks like using Regen Civics a little bit later. But this is just one map that we're using to say, look, we need to capture and we need to account for way more than just financial contributions. And what this really does is it unlocks a complete world of possibility because in the dominant systems today, and I think some of this was actually by design, is a lot of the ways humanity progresses doesn't happen unless those with money say so. Because the basic plan is this, you come up with a business plan, an idea of how you wanna change the world or bring new value or whatever, and then you go and seek investment. And that's typically how that works, is come up with a business plan and then go ask the people with money for permission. And this has been happening with a lot of regen village and land-based projects, where people are coming together to say, hey, we really wanna regenerate this piece of land, but first we need to raise enough money to buy it. And on the other side of that problem, we saw people with land, and this is beautiful because this has happened with several of our regenerative civics projects, is people with land that they want something beautiful to happen with that land. They don't just want to sell it because they live maybe next door to it and they don't want to sell it to some big, you know, development firm who's going to turn into something gaudy and terrible and just destroy the land. Or they really have a beautiful relationship with the land and they feel something beautiful needs to happen there. There's been a lot of different cases like this and they don't want to sell it. And maybe no one wants to buy it. So we have this problem. We have a group of humans who want to go and steward earth and make something beautiful, but they're not able to do that unless they get land or they get money first. And simultaneously you have someone with land who would love that there's a beautiful group of humans coming there to do stuff with it, but they don't want to sell that land directly to someone who might develop it for something awful. You can come down here to new proposal over to one time activity, and then you can just call in an expense. So if I want to contribute land to a project, I can put in the title, hey, I contributed land, my description, I can show proof of me sending the land title over to the legal entity, you know, put in an attachment, whatever I want to back it up, and then go through and claim my pay for it. So maybe the organization was paying me out in some of its treasury too. So I'd put how much of the treasury I'm getting paid out, and then I would take the remainder of it in the organization's tokens so that it's accounting for that contribution that I made. And maybe it's land, maybe it's equipment, whatever it is, it can go into this proposal space and then communities can, can um, recognize those contributions to the project. So this is where the do and that technology comes in is that can then sit in the middle and say, great, you wanna contribute that land? Then maybe you can sell it to this Wyoming Dow LLC. We'll say the land is worth 15 million and we're gonna issue 15 million tokens as a thank you for contributing this land. And maybe since we set up a legal container, those tokens actually represent shares. So now that company owns the land and now you own all the shares in that company. So you by effect own the land, right? And then when people show up to the property and they start developing it and adding value, planting trees, regenerating it, building their villages, whatever they're doing with that land, then they can be compensated for that time and that energy they're putting into it as well. And then they're issued out tokens. So now you have an equitable way of reciprocating all the value that's coming to a project. 
So when we look at the different forms of capital, we have roles that can capture any one of these forms of capital. And this is the point of roles within the do container as well, is that you could set it up and say, hey, we need more spiritual capital. So maybe you're a spiritual community and that's what you're focused on because you find a lot of value in that. Great, then you're gonna have a role that says you're our spiritual leader or you're the guru of the village or you're the healer or whatever it is. And then you can have a role that's recognizing that value and then reflecting them back out tokens for them contributing to the spiritual capital of that community, All right? So these are the different you know, coordination primitives that I keep talking about that help us coordinate and start our projects in a completely different, much more equitable way than the current systems are currently <laughs> supporting. So now when we come to here, we see the seeds ecosystem, at least one map of it on the left, and all the different forms of capital each one of those organizations is providing to the seeds economy. So now you see we have multiple organizations providing multiple forms of capital, but then we're getting the whole array of capital throughout the whole ecosystem, where one organization is not expected to give you know full in all eight forms because that would be expecting way too much out of one organization. But instead, that's split out throughout the whole ecosystem, right? So it's one different way of looking at this map is showing all the different organizations and how they're supporting all the different forms of capital in our new economic system. So what you see here is a list of all the different organizations that make up the Seeds Commons. So what we're wanting is that at the round tables, so that day two, all of the Commons organizations actually show up on day two and talk about all the different roles that they know they need. So this is one of the best places to show up if you're wanting to contribute in a role to show up on day two and listen to the different organizations and what they need and fill one of those needs if you can, if it fits with your regenerative key guy, right? The second way is then you can sense what the ecosystem might be missing. So if you're looking at all the commons organizations and your key guy is adding value in some way that we're not even touching yet, then that's an opportunity to also show up on day two and then present what you would like to bring to the ecosystem and then add a new organ. And this is how we can continually evolve as more people show up and say, yes, they want to be part of this journey to creating regenerative civilizations. They want to participate. They want to show up in some capacity. Fantastic. You know, bring that wisdom and energy here, figure out a place to put it or create a space for it if one doesn't already exist. And then that's how we can continually evolve. So now I want to get in a little bit more into crowd pooling and actually show you what this looks like. So you can come to an organization and again, you can buy their tokens and that's how you can raise the financial capital you need or you can go and hop into one of the roles. Show you what that looks like right here. So this is a dashboard of an organization within the Seeds Haifa economy, right? So you can come here and then you can go down and say, okay, what archetypes do they need? An archetype is a foundation for roles. We'll actually get into that a lot more in the next episode, but it's how we went about simplifying the infinite amount of roles that an organization could have. So we tried to simplify that process to reduce the complexity. But either way, you can go in and you can see what archetypes they have available, click on them, see what accountabilities are expected, what the purpose is, what the description is, see some of the comments about it, who voted on, all this stuff. So you can get an understanding of, yeah, actually this feels exactly like me. I feel like I wanna show up in this capacity. This organization's asking for this. Yeah, I would like to show up this way. So this is where you go over to new proposal, go down to recurring activity, go down to role assignment and click on the one that you just found. So I think that one was this one. And then you can go and put in a title of your proposal, pick which circle you wanna have it be part of, and then what objectives. So how are you wanting to show up? So you let the community know how you're wanting to bring value to the community. And this is another one of those sense-making tools that then as every additional assignment comes in, the rest of the community can look at it and be like, oh, that's how they're showing up. That's how I engage with them. These are the, the things they're trying to get accomplished over the next season. Okay, I understand how they're showing up in this community. So it really helps the community actually go through the process of understanding each other. So go ahead and fill all this out. Go down and pick what dates you wanna contribute for. So I'm just gonna go for one week because it's a trial and a lot of organizations, they'll have their own. Maybe some organizations, they wanna just have one week trials to get to know people first. Other organizations are more loose and they say, hey, hop in for an entire month or a few months and give it a try. You know, it's up to every organization to define what this looks like for them. But you pick the date and duration, then you talk about, um, well, then you go on to decide your compensation levels. 
So you could choose your commitment level. So this is really interesting that you can say, hey, I'm gonna show up 10% because this is just part time, I'm just exploring. Or hey, I'm 100%, I am full in, this is my, this is my life, you know? and anything in between. So it's a new way of being able to capture a diversity of different ways of people wanting to show up. Um, so you can say what commitment level you wanna be at. And then the deferred amount. So when I was talking about that working capital versus the tokens that organizations are able to mint and deliver, this is how they do it. Is within a DAO, you can mint all the HUSD you want. So this is what we call working capital. But you as an organization would be insolvent if you don't have a treasury that's backing up all of that HUSD, meaning you have an account that has tokens in it that you got from either people buying your token directly or the seeds commons or however you got this money. And this is what you would consider regular money in a company where you say, hey, we have a treasury with this much. So this is what you would use for HUSD is then you can mint out claims to that treasury. And this is what people would be using to pay for rent and sell immediately to central bank currencies, etc. But maybe you're just starting as an organization and you have a very small treasury and people are okay with that because they're like, yeah, we understand we're just getting started. So we want to take most of our pay in the organization tokens. So this is what the deferred means. If you're saying I'm deferring 10% of my pay, then most of your pay is going to come up front and money that you can then convert to cash and use to pay rent. But say you're deferring 90%, then 90% of your pay is going to be in the organization token, which this organization is able to mint and deliver. So watch how to do a do if you really want to get into the mechanics of this more. Um, and then the final one is voice. So then it's able to issue a unique governance token for participating in this organization. So as people are contributing, they're earning voice, and then they're the ones that are voting on the next round of proposals of people who have contributed and earned voice, right? And then of course you can design voice in a myriad of different ways. Maybe everyone just earns one voice once they're a member, one member, one voice, or however an organization wants to do it. And then at the end, you see the total US dollar equivalent, just to simplify it for people, of how much they're expected to get paid. Um, and then of course you review it, then you can put it up for a proposal, and then the community can vote on it and decide whether or not they wanna pass it. So that works for roles which captures so much that projects need. So they can come up front when they're raising all the capital for their project and up front, they can actually say, these are all the roles that we need filled. We're gonna need all six of these roles filled for us to be able to execute on our mission. So they can actually sit there and fill those roles in advance before they consider their crowd pooling campaign complete, which is really powerful because then people who are also giving financial capital they have more trust that it's going to succeed because they know that the people are actually there to follow through with the mission as well. So this is how you can capture roles. Then how do you capture everything else? You can come down here to new proposal over to one time activity, and then you can just call in an expense. So if I want to contribute land to a project, I can put in the title, Hey, I contributed land, my description. I can show proof of me sending the land title over to the legal entity, you know, put in an attachment, whatever I want to back it up and then go through and claim my pay for it. So maybe the organization was paying me out in some of its treasury too. So I'd put how much of the treasury I'm getting paid out. And then I would take the remainder of it in the organization's tokens so that it's accounting for that contribution that I made. And maybe it's land, maybe it's equipment, whatever it is, it can go into this proposal space and then communities can, can um, recognize those contributions to the project. So this is the basic idea behind crowd pulling is that we can come together and we can raise way more than just money. We can raise all the other resources and assets we need in order to be successful as a project. And we can equitably and accurately and transparently, you know, account for all those contributions. So it's an entirely different way of bringing people together to do a project that looks very different than our traditional corporate structure and the route that those organizations go on. All right, so let's bring it back. So that's the basics behind crowd pooling is not only are we setting up our project and say, Hey, we're raising financial capital to help us execute our mission. You could raise all the other forms of capital that you need. And something that's worth saying again and again is <laughs> the idea of being able to raise roles because time is the often forgotten ninth form of capital, something that we all have. And this is what's, you know, I'm calling it the great equalizer across the globe. But once we have these global economies and organizations that anyone across the globe can contribute to and earn parts of, 
then we've equalized access to this opportunity because everyone has time. It's all up to us how we choose to spend that time and every project needs time. So even when we're talking about the Regen Civics projects, which we'll talk about a little bit more, but to, <laughs> to touch on them, they need people to show up to the Regen Civics festivals. So these are when we kickstart a project and we're planting gardens and building housing or retrofitting old housing or whatever the regenerative project is. It requires a lot of people just showing up and putting their hands in the dirt. And this is something, again, anyone can do. And it would be really beautiful if people could then show up to projects this way and then be equitably compensated for showing up and doing that rather than relying on, you know, volunteerism, which is what, you know, the old system's all about is it's broken. It's like, hey, everything that's good for the world needs to be volunteer and unpaid and charity. Otherwise, it's evil. And then we're going to pay for all the things that are destroying the planet. So it's completely out of whack economy. And we actually want to realign that and say, no, doing good for people, planet and making the world a better place ought to be the most profitable thing. So this is the journey that we're on right now is how do we do that? And we do that by equalizing access so that anyone can participate in this change. So that's what tokens and roles and this DAO and all these tools are really all about, is making sure we're equitably and accurately distributing value and acknowledging people for participating in this. And all the other ways that they help us coordinate and make decisions and move forward together in a fraud, resistant, trustless, and transparent way. <laughs> you know. um, so the one thing that's been guiding us, this is one of our organizing principles, right, is the law of reciprocity. So that is if you give, reflect back. So that's really the entire function of tokens. If you really want to simplify it down, this is the law of reciprocity. Energy was provided to a project or a cause or a purpose. Let's reflect energy back out in the form of a token, an acknowledgement, right? And then we can value all the capitals equally rather than the money capital being able to get all the shares of a company because that's just how the game works. And then the employees are stuck with like, you know, pitiful stock options, etc. cetera. Um, I think actually a lot of companies are doing a lot better today and trying to make that old paradigm kind of work better, but it was still fundamentally flawed. It was designed from a lens that financial capital is the most important form of capital and that should make all of the calls and all the decisions. But what we're saying is actually no, projects don't necessarily need money. Money is just the medium to get what the projects really need. Every project really needs all the things money can buy. They really need land. They really need people's time, etc. So financial capital, we really need to kind of lower it back down to its rightful form, which is just one of the many forms of capital that projects actually need. So these are the tools that help us be able to do that. So now we're going to talk about tokenomics. And we're gonna use HIFA as examples. So HIFA is issuing these HIFA tokens and any organization can do it too. So if you see them up here, this is where you can kind of see the HIFA tokens being distributed and how many. So what does that token actually mean for an organization? And I was talking about the idea that every organization gets to define this for themselves. Some might mean that that token represents a share in a legal entity. Why others say that it has no value and meaning at all, it's just a form of acknowledgement for a donation. But what HYPA does is it's built a kind of an interesting staking model around the token. Because we really wanted to get everyone who's part of the ecosystem to co-own that ecosystem and have the shared interest in taking care of the ecosystem. So then how do we do this? We say that every organization that's building a do within the HYPA ecosystem, and what that means is that when you go up on your <laughs> screen and you're and you're in your organization and you're due, then you can easily hop to other organizations. They're right there. So just like in Discord and other apps, you can move from one organization to the next. I'm actually gonna show it right here. So you can see up in the top left, you'd be able to jump to different organizations that you're part of, or in your profile, you see all the organizations who you're connected with, all the different roles and assignments from all the different organizations. So it's giving you one place to see all the tokens, all the roles and everything that's happening across all the different organizations you're a part of. So that's what it means to be part of the Haifa ecosystem. And you can come down here to your wallet and see all the different tokens from all the different projects you're a part of as well. All right, coming back. So you wanna be part of the Haifa ecosystem. Well, in order to do that, then you're gonna to need to earn by either contributing to Haifa in some capacity so financial contribution or time or you're in a role or whatever it is, you're gonna have to obtain some HIFA tokens and then stake that. So this is locking them up. So it's kind of like a term deposit where you're taking those tokens and you're saying, I'm gonna lock them up here for a period of time. And then that gives you access to the ecosystem. 
So what this means is that as more and organizations are joining and the ecosystem's growing, then more of these HIFA tokens are needing to be taken out of circulation and locked away. So this creates a demand for those tokens, which then is healthy. So this is what creates balance. If the ecosystem is growing, then we probably need more roles to take care of that growing ecosystem, build more tools. And those people are being compensated in this HIFA token, which means we're creating more of it. In order for us to be able to create more of it with the price to still go up and hold stable, we need people to be wanting that token and taking it out of circulation. So that's the basic mechanics here is people need the token as the ecosystem grows. What this also means is that organizations don't have an overhead cost necessarily, at least they don't have to. We also offer that option. So if you just wanna pay a monthly fee like regular software services, you can. And then HIFA will host you and there's some costs associated with that, which is why we have to charge, um, et cetera. So you can do the regular software route or you can be part of the ecosystem, which is what this route is about and what I really advocate for, for the whole seeds economy. So then what it looks like is now you have an investment because you have those HIFA, you can still unstake them and sell and leave the ecosystem if you want. But the value of them could be going up. So the value of an asset that your organization's holding could be going up as the whole ecosystem successful. So then this aligns all of our interests. Now we all want HIFA to succeed because we're all holding a share of HIFA and this is all becoming a shared HIFA ecosystem. So this is a way of looking at tokens is how do we design tokens for collaboration to align our interests and to create sustainable financial systems so that we can compensate people for doing work and moving the ecosystem forward and all the stuff that we need to do. Um, so this is what we call, you know, basic tokenomics. You can explore it more here and explore more of the Haifa ecosystem and how it works. Um, but I'm just gonna touch on just a few more things. So what I talked about with the Haifa token, first it's access. So you need to stake some if you want a certain level of access. And what access means is like you can have um, 50 transactions a week that are free, fee free. So when you're doing governance on chain and you're voting on proposals and you're putting up assignments, those are all transactions that happen on the chain that Haifa is providing and helping, you guys, helping these organizations use. So Haifa actually has to reserve some bandwidth. So there's a cost for us. So as an organization grows and requires more bandwidth, meaning they're putting up more proposals, they have more transactions they want to send, there's more people in their organization, etc., then you need to acquire and stake more HIFA. But this is beautiful economically because then you only have a cost if you're growing, which means your organization is being successful as well. So we got rid of that, you know, you have a monthly fee regardless for a piece of software that's not connected with the health of your organization. Now, instead we say you get a certain level of transactions a week that you're allotted because you have this many tokens staked. And if you need to increase that allotment, that means your organization's growing, you're more healthy. And then you take some of that revenue then and you acquire HIFA tokens and you lock them up, which then aligns all the financial and economic interests of all the organizations. So that's one is access. You need to stake more HIFA as you grow. The second one is when you have staked HIFA, and Haifa as an organization is helping all of these dues launch. So different organizations are launching. They all have their own unique token. Part of that deal with Haifa helping organizations launch is that they give some of their new tokens to all the people who have staked Haifa. So when Do 2 over here gets started, they're going to give some of their tokens over to Do 1 and to Haifa because both of them have Haifa and they have it staked and anyone else in the world who's buying and staking Haifa as well. You know, do three gets launched, then they airdrop some of their tokens to do two and do one. So what this looks like is that the organizations who are part of the ecosystem, they're all co-invested into each other as well. So now we're aligning the interests of all of the organizations automatically. Every new organization that joins it, airdrops some of its tokens to every organization who's already part of it. So that we all have that shared interest to support each other, start collaborating, doing projects together, open source our information and share it with each other because we're not competing because their success is your success, etc. So it creates the foundations for a more cooperative economy to form. And the last one is pay for services. So at some point, if Haifa feels like this model is not sustainable enough, then we can start introducing fees. Um, I'm proposing that we never add fees for basic stuff within a DAO. I think that ought to always be fee free because we want to be able to encourage people to contribute um, and participate in their organizations without having that cost. But maybe Haifa builds specialty contracts 
maybe they're really valuable, but they're kind of niche and you don't really need to use them that often. And when you're using that contract, you pay a fee. Or there's some other ways that HIFA can introduce fees. But what's interesting here is that when you're also staking a HIFA token, you're earning voice, which means you get to participate in the governance of HIFA as well. So when I'm saying HIFA might introduce fees, well, every organization and every person who's bought and staked HIFA, well, they get to participate in that vote as well. So we're not saying there'll be this centralized organization that might push fees onto the ecosystem. The ecosystem is governed by the ecosystem, which is the tools we're building here, right? So that's where it starts getting really interesting is then HIFA itself slowly as the ecosystem, you know, matures, then it'll actually, I think the mature state is that there's a HIFA core team who's building stuff, but really all of the decisions are made throughout the whole ecosystem of organizations that make up the HIFA economy, right? So this is what organizations who are building on the HIFA tool set look like within the seeds economy. So you actually see it kind of fractaling down is you see the arrow coming from up here. <laughs> That's coming down from that image where tokens are being distributed from the seeds commons, some of that working capital we were talking about, to all the various organs within the seeds economy. So some of that working capital is also coming down to HIFA. So then HIFA is using that working capital to pay developers and people who are building all these tools their upfront pay so that they can pay for rent and buy food. Um, but major the majority of pay in HIFA, I think it's been around 70, 80% over the years is coming in HIFA tokens. So most people are just kind of taking the bare minimum because HIFA hasn't raised a bunch of money. We've been totally grassroots this entire point, um, this entire time. But what this looks like is then that money comes down from the Seeds Commons and then it can use some of that working capital and pay out some of the dues who are building tools and everything else that the HIFA technology needs. So this is how the economy starts to fractal down infinitely, is every one of those organs within the Seeds economy can have its own ecosystem that fractals out underneath it. So HIFA has its kind of ecosystem of dues. You know, movement building might have its ecosystem of movement building organizations and people who are focused on, you know, on the ground activations. Storytelling Circle might have its ecosystem of storytelling organizations who are all focused on telling the story of systems change, etc. So this is how the ecosystem kind of expands out infinitely is through fractaling, right? Ooh, that's a big one. So we'll leave that for a second uh, and then we'll keep going. So then every do has the capacity to mint their own tokens. So this is how we can supplement the working capital of the Seeds Commons. So maybe the Seeds Commons only got, you know, 200,000 in a season. So that's enough to pay people their, you know, their basic needs, but that's not enough to accurately compensate the ways they're showing up. So this is again where that utility contribution accounting token comes in. So then each organization within the Seeds Commons would be able to use HUSD to mint that working capital to the people. So the money they're getting from the commons or other investors or whatever, that's the money they can then send out to people who need that money to pay rent, buy food, etc. And then the rest of their compensation, and I think we need to pay people equitably, is then coming in those organizations tokens. And then one thing that I highly advocate for to start further aligning interests, making things equitable and helping some some of these new organizations to kickstart themselves is this is why the seeds alliances exist. So the seeds alliances is there's a pool of seeds and currently it looks like there's about 346 million remaining in that pool. They were set aside to give out to organizations, specifically all the ones that are part of the seeds commons so that they have a large share of the seeds economy as well. And then they can use these seeds to back the value of their utility token. So then you think, okay, what's the value of this new token that this new organization's minting and giving out? Well, it could be backed by the alliance share that that organization gets. So if they're sitting on 30 million seeds and they've only issued three utility tokens, and they said these utility tokens have a claim to all of our treasury, well then those three utility tokens are worth 30 million seeds. And that might give them a base price just there. So this is a bootstrapping mechanism to help some of these other organizations get started, build a foundational treasury that's giving value to that organization so they can start minting their own tokens and have people accept them and know that there's something valuable there behind them. Of course, as long as Seeds is succeeding, which is the whole idea here. We're putting these organizations out there to help Seeds succeed, which is then that feedback loop. Um, and again, this just further aligns interests in making sure all the organizations who are helping Seeds succeed 
have that shared interest. Haifa got this when it set it, all of this up. It said, hey, we wanted an alliance share, essentially, um, for helping build all the technology and bootstrap this and catalyze it. Great. That was equitable and that was fair. Now we can give that to every other organization who's getting set up here as well. So we can also be equitable and fair to those organizations and help them get started. So again, that's what the Alliance is all about. And that's up to the citizens to decide, you know, how much a new organization should get and if they're going to get it at all. And then, of course, you can come to the Dew Treasury and actually see how many seeds the Haifa Dew is holding on to and what's their Haifa token balances and all that stuff. So every organization would then be able to prominently display their seeds alliance and what's backing their utility token. If, of course, that organization wants to do that model, but you don't have to. Ooh, all right. So that was a whole lot. And now what we're going to do is we're going to do a walkthrough of regenerative civics. So this is another one of those organs within the seeds ecosystem. So I just talked about Haifa a little bit. Now we're going to talk a little bit about regenerative civics. And this is actually going to weave back around into episode one, where we talked about our journey where we started off with food and eco villages and permaculture before we got into the economy and governance and everything else. So this is how we weave it all back to the beginning is over the last few years, we felt like it was getting a little bit too theoretical and we really wanted to ground it into practical, on the ground regenerative actions. So that was what catalyzed the birth of regenerative civics in that organ was great. We've got all these tools. Now we got to apply them on the ground and see how we can help this transition very practically from our degenerative economies to regenerative ones. 